x and 7x. So there's a protein that facilitates this chemical reaction. Now normally, if you take E. coli and you have an agarose plate, or you have a plate with agar, not agarose, sorry, and you put glucose in here, and I think you have to put biotin as a vitamin. You need to put some salts. Obviously, there's water. What else did I put in there? They need a source of nitrogen. What did I put in there for nitrogen? I can't remember. What is the nitrogen? Does anyone know? Let's just say amino acids. Means amino acids. If you put that on here, oh, let's, say, let's say a glutamate. <coughs> glutamate is one amino acid. So there's nitrogen in that compound. And the bacteria, if they need histidine, they will just chemically modify glutamate until it comes down this pathway and they make histidine, and that's the amino acid they use, right? So this is called a minimal medium. So if I have wild type E. coli, these guys grow just fine. They get colonies. If I take those cells and spread them out on this plate, like this, I get colonies of cells growing up all over the place. So what Ames did, what Dr. Ames did, is found an E. coli that was mutant in gene X here, such that if the X deficient, I shouldn't have chose X because you think X chromosome, let's say uh, M, okay. enzyme M. The strain is lacking enzyme M. Enzyme, shit, oh, I can't say it. Enzyme M. Should have chosen a different J. So, right. If you try to plate that on minimal media, nothing grows. Because E. coli has to have histidine in order to grow to make its proteins. But if we did the minimal media and we did plus histidine, so in addition to all of this, and we added histidine, now the organism doesn't have to, it doesn't matter if it has this enzyme or not because we're giving it, we've complemented the mutation by providing an exogenous source. Right? So these guys will grow on his plus medium. Right? So I have my strain, which is deficient for this enzyme, on minimal media, nothing grows. On plus his media, it's got to grow all over the place. Okay, so let's talk about this gene. And this is all, like, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not reciting from a paper that I read recently. I'm just kind of making this up as I'm going along, just as an example, all right? I'm not that smart. So if we have the code for this, we've got a termination code on, and we've got an initiation code on, and you know, the messenger RNA is going to be longer than this. I'm not worried about this stuff out here. In the code, oh, is that candy? Can you hear something that fell? That's a chapstick. A chapstick. Uh, I don't think I can grab that right now. Uh, we'll get that after class. <laughs> All right. So what Dr. Ames did is somewhere in here, you know, we code three nucleotides for an amino acid, right? So what Dr. Ames did is let's say that this is um, T T. A. Now, I don't remember what amino acid that goes for. Does anyone know? What's your favorite amino acid? Proline. Proline is now my favorite amino acid. That goes for proline. So, what Dr. Ames did is Dr. Ames mutated. Huh? Sure, of course it would. Proline's an awesome amino acid. It's the best one out there is mutated the sequence into TAA or TGA, either one. There's a termination code on this. 
So the reason the enzyme was dead is the wild type protein goes like this and it folds up into something and then this catalyzes this reaction. But when the enzyme has this premature termination code on in it, you get just a little nib of protein made off of here before it hits the termination code. And none of these amino acids get incorporated and you wind up with a protein like that that can't do anything. That's why these guys had to be given histidine as they couldn't manufacture it. This step was blocked. Okay. So we have this set up. We can now define an assay to test for things that mutate DNA. I hope now at the end of the semester when I say assay, you're like, okay, it's a procedure you run through and there's a readout. That's your assay, right? An assay for mutagenic compounds. So the assay, the experiment, is to take these guys. These are M minus, these are E. coli that are mutant. And here we put them in a tube with his plus media, so they grow. And here we put these guys in a media that has his plus, and And also in this tube, we're going to add caffeine. Now let's do, now let's add nicotine. All right? So what would you call this? And what would you call this? In general terms for an experiment, this is a control. And this is my experimental condition. What's the hypothesis we're testing here? Better than the no nicotine? Yeah. Or does it? How often does this guy living in media mutate back, revert back to wild type? And how often does this guy revert back to wild type? And the only difference in the condition is the presence of nicotine. Right? So anytime DNA polymerase copies and makes a new cell, Every now and then, one of those cells is going to be a mutation. It'll revert back to wild type, right? Okay. okay. So in this one, if we take, if we incubate these guys for 24 hours in normal media, and we plate them out, what we get is a plate like this, and there's a few colonies on it. Just naturally, through whatever happened, cosmic rays came from outer space and zapped the DNA, and some of these guys mutated, reverted back wild type. Right? In this case, now the question is, there's two ways, three, three possible answers to this. What's, what's one possible answer? Say I've got five colonies on here. So we have five possible answers to what? I have, there's three, three, possible, three possible possibilities how this could come up. How could it come up? More or less or the same. More or less or the same. Yeah. So if it comes out, Say it came out six colonies grew on here. I put, I, by calculations, I put a million, a million bacterial cells here, five of them grew. I put a million cells here from here, and six of them grew. Does nicotine cause mutations? No. Probably not. What if this came out one? What do you conclude? Someone over on this side this time. Someone over on this side. I don't really think you can make a conclusion from that. Okay, why not? What, where am I going with it? If you were to make a conclusion. You could say that um, the nicotine doesn't allow for like genetic mutations. Nicotine protects from yeah. genetic mutations. 
But I really think like the difference between five and one cells is so minimal. Yeah, yeah that's true. You, there, you need to run the experiment a large number of times and consistently yeah. get the same results. And then use statistics to Okay. And what if it came out like this? Something crazy would happen. We should all start some. You should all start small talk. Oh, uh, unless you want to. Become a I know, unless you girl. want like a gene back and you want it to mutate back, then. Yeah, but if it, it, it's, it's going to go back, it might go. It might go yeah, yeah. a little other way. Right, right. So in this case, you know, there's a thousand felonies on here. It would suggest that nicotine helps mutate DNA because this got mutated back to the root version. To the, you know, to the wild type, and it can grow then, right? Okay, yeah? Why would the cell like want to mutate if it knew that it was getting histidine from the environment? So when it just recognized that, you're like, why not just rely on whatever environment I'm surrounding to get? Yeah, so that's a great question, and it gets at, it gets at the, the fundamental thought of do cells choose to be mutated, or, or is mutation just random and they're selected? And what Bar Darwin would have proposed, and I think what I propose also, is cells, for the purposes of this class, cells don't sense their environment and say, eh, I'm not doing so well, I should mutate myself to maybe, maybe I'll turn out better. So they just kind of randomly mutate. If you put a chemical in there and that chemical damages the DNA, that randomly damages the DNA and sometimes those guys get randomly damaged in just the right way they can survive. Could that help? I guess I would think that like you would say it would be you'd be more fit if you could figure out a mechanism to get histidine to be you know, absorbed by those cells versus trying to make a whole mechanism to make it yourself. So I, I missed that. Say it again. It's like, if, they, if you mutate it so that way that you could produce this thing and make it yourself versus like getting it from the environment. If you have an environment that's always rich in history, why wouldn't that be like favorable to get oh. a mechanism that's not? Oh, you're, so you're saying this is rich in history. This is rich in history. Sorry, this is played on minimal media. There's no history here. Okay. These guys shouldn't come. Um, uh, in the PowerPoint file, it explains this a little more clearly. So I think the chalk talks are more effective in getting. Shouldn't it be like histone minus then? Yeah, these are his minus. These, there's no his, no histidine in here. Oh. So they're his minus. Oh, these plates are his minus. Oh yeah, that was important. <laughs> I'm going to give you some other results. here, and you put a million here, 900,000 of them were dead. 
or on their way to death. Okay, that's one possibility. What's another possibility? Say I put a hundred or a million on here that were live and viable. We knew that they were live and viable. Say that they have a mutation that makes them more fit now that they've been able to overcome the thinium bromide. So like they had selected out. The thinium bromide made mutations elsewhere that made them more fit. But then you'd expect more colonies, yes? Well, but you, like the certain mutations that did occur. So, like, the, you know, if you were playing something on ampicillin and only like one colony survived, that's ampicillin resistant. Does that make sense? I, I'm running out of brain power here today. That's a really interesting comment. <laughs> um, you're probably onto something, and I'm actually I'm running out of brain power today. I woke up way too early with my kids this morning. So you're saying other mutations happen elsewhere to make it more fit to survive it when being exposed to thenium bromide. When being exposed to thenium bromide. And so why is the data low? Why are these numbers lower? Because well, like you should like most would survive that process, but there's a few that did. Okay. That kind of gets along the lines of what he was saying is yeah. overcoming a thenium bromide toxicity. Yeah. Well, it could be that. There may be the same amount of mutations, but because the ethidium bromide goes into the DNA itself, it could be that the proteins just aren't made as okay. much. What's the damage that ethidium bromide does to DNA frame shifts? Frame shifts, he said that. Frame shifts. What type of mutation are we looking for in this line of bacteria? A point mutation, a substitution of one nucleotide. Athenium bromide isn't going to create the kinds of mutations that help that. In fact, athenium bromide is going to make this situation worse. And that's what happened. How can you do it? How can you get an AIMS test that will look for chemicals that do frame shifts? Yeah, yeah. Instead of looking for a substitution that causes a premature initiation codon, you just look for something where there was an extra nucleotide added, say, here. And now the reading frame on all these amino acids is off, and you won't make the protein. The effect is the same. You have something that can't produce histidine, and it's dependent on the outside environment. There are many different kinds of mutations that can happen. Insertions, deletions, substitutions. And you can actually go and call companies up and say, I want the Ames test panel. And they send you like 50 different strains of E. coli, each, each E. coli having some different kind of mutation in it that will detect a frame shift or a substitution or what, some change to the DNA specifically. And you can test that out. How's that sound? Useful. Useful. So, um, the way this test is run in reality is um, if you eat something that's toxic and that stuff goes into your digestive system, it goes into your hepatic um, portal vein, that is the, the blood that's going to, the blood that picks things things up from your digestive system goes to your liver. So the first thing in your body that encounters your food that you're absorbing is your liver. And what your liver does is it tries to detoxify any chemicals that things are toxic. So the way this test is actually run is in addition to media, they take, um, basically they take liver, right? They take liver from like mice that are dead they died of natural causes, okay? They take their livers out, and they grind it up in a blender, I'm not joking, and they take a little bit of that goop, and they put that in here, and all of the liver enzyme things that detoxify, 
are in that group. So now you have not just media, but all the enzymes that would normally process counters. Because you might eat something, and your liver detoxifies it, so it's not doesn't cause cancer. Does that make sense? Okay. So that's the ant test. And it turns out, I think Dr. Ames is still alive today and believes that this test is hogwash and is not at all a way of testing to see if something causes cancer. And now hates that his name was associated with this test because he it thinks it's not, he believes it isn't an appropriate representation. Okay. So, the Ames test is how you can tell if something's going to become a TMNT, right? <laughs> this came out when I was in what? Uh, high school. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. It came out when I was in high school. So here's the Ames test. And on this set of PowerPoint five slides, um, it basically runs through all of this that I ran through on a chalk talk here today. Any comments or questions about the AIMS test? So, aside from the AIMS test, there are other ways to determine if things cause cancer. <laughs> that woke you up, didn't it? So, some of you may, in fact, um, work with mice in kind of these kinds of experiments that happen, or rats or such. And if you've got a mouse and, or a rat, for some reason they squeak when they see needles too. Um, they seem to not like the idea of getting stuck in their tummy with this. Um, the way to quiet them down is to give them a little gentle shake like that. And they, as they get in the balance, that's when you stick them and they're okay with it. They'll squeak, but they'll be okay. So in addition to doing the Ames test, they will actually run experiments on mice. And what they'll do is they'll take the chemical and they'll put it in the food. So the animal's eating some of that. And then they'll measure, I've got 100 mice here that are eating normal food. I have 100 mice here that are eating the contaminated food that have the chemical in it. I've got five here that got cancer. And I have 17 here that got cancer. I think this chemical causes cancer, right? They can inject it. Quite often what they'll do is they'll get the chemical insoluble in some solution. It could be water, it could be alcohol or something like that. And they'll shave the back of the mouse. And they'll basically use like a uh, fingernail painting brush and brush that onto the mouse's back every day at a certain time. So there's a continual um, surface, continually exposed. Usually run, when they run these studies, so the pesticides that are applied to our foods, to our produce, tomatoes and such. If you go online, you'll see that those chemicals cause cancer in mice. If you put those chemicals, you expose mice to those chemicals. The concentration that you would encounter them on an apple in the course of your day, the amount that you put in your body is magnitudes lower than the amount they were putting on the mice to get the mice to develop cancer. So, yeah, it's true. Those, if you expose those animals to high levels of those pesticides, it happens. If you're a farm worker and you're spilling that stuff on you all day, probably important. The question is whether it's relevant at the concentrations that we're exposed to. Right? So when doing these tests, why don't they just Expose it to a normal concentration because you don't get cancer. <laughs> um, so they, so they, like... they might be they might cause cancer, but at a very low level, right? Okay. And so if I have a, if I have so a mouse is one mouse costs five dollars a day to raise in a lab, and they follow these things out for two years. So one mouse five bucks times seven hundred days. That's a lot of money for one mouse. So if I'm going to do 100 mice, that's a huge dollar to just maintain the mice, let alone pay for the people who are going to do all the work and all this stuff. Um, that's cage, food, water. It's really $5 a day? Yes. For a mouse? Yes. 
Right. And you think it'd be less, but um, the U.S. government says you have to care for mice a certain way, and there are it's, it's amazing the regulations. And, uh, the mice have to have exposure to certain things which would be entertainment to them. You know, like they need things that are going to roll around the cage and stuff for humane treatment. Right? That's the way it works. To give them cancer. So, <laughs> so if I have a hundred mice and I'm exposing them to a really low level of this pesticide, and it causes cancer, but at a really low level, I might have five mice get cancer here and five mice in the control. The only way I would see if it causes cancer is if I have 100,000 mice and 100,000 mice. Here I have uh, 600, and here I have 500. And I said, if that ha happens every time, great. But who has money for 100,000 mice to follow for two years, and let alone maintaining, where would that facility be? So they just give them a lot of. So they increase the dose. Just pretty much to say it gives cancer. Just yeah. to prove the point. <laughs> right. um, another thing they do is they have mice, which they have developed breeds of mice that are incredibly prone to developing cancer. And so, like, if you have mice, like half of them will get cancer in a year. And the question is, okay. Um, you can, you can measure the, the kinetics of how fast they develop cancer in a normal situation. They say, now in the control or in the experimental condition where I add this chemical, can I get the, that onset of cancer to happen earlier and in more mice? So they're doing it in these backgrounds with mice are prone to getting cancer. It may not be relevant for human physiology. Either. So pretty much any study where mice gets cancer, I really just shouldn't care. And well, that, you need to look at the details. Okay. The details. And, and I'm, I'm one who likes to believe that, you know, we should be, I like growing my own food at home because I know those things aren't in there. Um, but the data is to support it. So um, it turns out, carcinogens, there's two types of things that cause cancer. There's two ways a chemical could cause cancer. One is that chemical can go to the DNA and physically get the DNA and damage the DNA such that now there's a mutation. And the other way is um, a chemical could hurt a cell and cause the cell to die. Now there's an empty space in the body and a neighboring cell will divide to fill up that space. And we've learned in this class, every time a cell divides, DNA polymerase makes a few mistakes, so the cells are not identical. And every now and then, one of those mutations is in a cancer gene that promotes the cell, that newly created cell becoming cancerous. Does that make sense? So, um, two different ways. One is direct and one is indirect. And it turns out, people who smoke cigarettes, in cigarettes there are numerous compounds which in mice cause cancer. And the ash, the soot in the air, the smoke, that gets into the lungs is an abrasive that rubs on the cells and it's like sandpaper and damages and destroys cells, causes the cells to divide. So smoking causes cancer two ways, the chemicals and the continual abuse of the cells, causing them to divide more often. Does that make sense? All right. Epidemiology of cancer. The first connections that I was exposed to this, I have cancer. People who weren't exposed to it, they don't have cancer. Believe it or not, it was in the 70s, in my lifetime. People was started realizing that chemical is called all those people who like handled Agent Orange are all getting these awful diseases. Maybe Agent Orange was the cause of that of those problems. Um, it was called the big lie when I was a kid. Everybody knew that cigarettes caused cancer, but no one had ever had a study where someone could say definitively, the only difference between me having cancer and this person not having cancer is that I smoked and this person didn't. Because how many times was I born with someone immediately next to me, genetically identical? We worked in the same factory, we lived in the same house, but I smoked and that person didn't. It's an un I mean, it's an uncontrolled experiment. So you, would, you do epidemiology, and you look at populations, and you make general conclusions about it. 
So the question is, can you demonstrate for sure that the thing the person was exposed to caused the cancer, or is it something else? It's really hard to do. Um, back to the epidemiology. Um, there's a um, quite often at many colleges, many institutions, what will happen is um, when when the freshmen arrive, they have the um, convocation. Do you remember convocation when you arrived? Mm -hmm. Or was it? Was it in the? It was in the gym. Was in the gym. Yeah. And quite often at those, every school has those with the freshman class that comes in. Um, quite often the speaker will say, look to your left, look to your right, one of you won't be here to graduate, right? You guys have heard that kind of show. <laughs> so what I'm going to say to you is in this classroom, look to your right, look to your left. So out of the three of you, one of you is going to die from cancer, and one of you is going to survive from cancer and die from something else. The odds of you getting cancer right now in your lifetime are about 50%, and that number is increasing because it appears that the environment has changed, that the cancer rates are increasing. We must have changed the environment in some way, or we're not eating properly, or something's happening, or engaging in a lifestyle that is causing this. The momentum is for humans to get cancer more readily than in the past, yes. I feel like that's just because we have the technology to know that someone's dying with cancer. Yeah, is it because like it used to be Farmer Joe died and we're like, oh, bummer for Farmer Joe, I wonder why he died. It was pretty old. Yeah, like and now we're like, we got landed to do an autopsy. Oh, there was cancer there, and so we identified. That's probably part of it too. But I, I the general trend is that more people are getting cancer. Is it also because we live longer? Is there a chance to get cancer? Yeah, part of that. Um, although you guys are on the downslope. Um, so, my generation, the expected lifespan of me is longer than the expected lifespan of my, my parents. Because they're both around. The expected lifespan of you is about the same as your parents. The kids who have just been born, their expected lifespan is less than your expected lifespan. So it's not just it's not just that we're living longer to get cancer. <laughs> I, I, don't, I can't answer that. I, I, I think it's because we are living in an environment, whatever that is. It's a polluted environment. It's a, it's a, we're packed together more densely. We're eating things that are less healthy. We're not exercising the same. Yeah, I think so. No, no, this is U.S. statistics. Oh, okay. So the, there's more to it than I can answer. So exercise. It's another reason. Remember, I was talking about DNA methylation. If uh, if you don't exercise, those genes can get locked away, and they can be locked away for your progeny too, right? So another reason to get into the gym, right? New Year's resolution. Isn't there like a pretty simple chemical that they found that has had pretty significant evidence to like cure cancer? Uh, there's no there's no cure for cancer. I know it's not like a cure, but I know I read an article. Or a few that there, I can't remember the chemical now, of course, but a lot of people who took it just as like a vitamin supplement who had cancer showed like almost complete tumor reduction without any other reason. That's probably a specific type of tumor. Okay. So you think every every cancer is different. That's true. Do you think in our lifetime there is a potential for a cure? There will never be a pill that you take that cures cancer. Why? Um, that's the final three lectures that we talk about in this class. Okay. There may be a pill you can take that will cure a specific kind of cancer or specifically tailored to your cancer yes, through to your cancer. Very high technology. So um, my wife had breast cancer a couple years ago. And then <coughs> within a year, her mother also had it. And even though similar type of, you know, same location, you'd say same genetics in the person, you know, 
obviously the genetics are very similar. The treatment my wife got is different than the treatment that her mother got because every tumor is different. If my wife got breast cancer in the other breast, they wouldn't treat her, they wouldn't treat that tumor the way they treated the first one because it's not the same disease. Okay. And I'll explain why in the next couple of lectures. Okay. So we've talked about different kinds of mutations. Let's talk a little bit about how mutations get repaired. So we've talked about these thymine dimers. Thymine is normally like this, and UV light can actually get this odd cyclical structure to exist, and it bends the DNA, and these nucleotides can't be read. So bacteria have a gene called photolyase that can undo that. We don't have one. Um, what we have, I'll show you in a second, is a device that also repairs, sometimes DNA gets chemical groups added onto it for odd reasons. Those can be taken off. I guess I shouldn't have put that on there. I should have had this slide next. We talked about how sometimes a base can just go floating away, right? So the way this system works is there are machines that are continually running up and down the DNA looking for DNA that the sugar phosphate backbone that's distorted or there's a missing space in there, and the, there's probably half a dozen different types of machines, each one looking for its own type of mutation. So there's a machine that runs along, if it finds an empty space like this, it cuts the DNA by the empty space. This is the five prime end, and this is the three prime end. That machine then brings DNA polymerase in, and DNA polymerase uses the three prime end as its primer, and it says, oh, I need to put a T here. And that, that DNA polymerase will actually run down for quite a ways. It'll eat this away as it's working its way down. So it eventually fills all that back in, and the DNA ligase comes in and connects them back together. And we've repaired this mistake here, that missing base, right? There's another machine that comes through. It's the UVR, UVA, UVC. And it's this group of proteins. That's the name of the proteins. And if they find, here's a, the thymine dimer. If they find a thymine dimer, it distorts the DNA so that there's this bulge in the sugar phosphate backbone. This machine binds to that bulge. They don't show it. There should be a bulge in here. And it actually brings in this, this machine that cuts the DNA and strips away part of this region. So we're left with a single strand of piece of DNA. And then, again, DNA polymerase comes in and says, oh, here's a 3 prime end. Let's fill this in. And it reads its way down for some ways and eventually it falls off. The DNA ligase connects those guys back together. But remember, this is DNA polymerase. So every time a repair is made, it could put a wrong nucleotide in here, right? which would require DNA repair machinery to come in and rip that out and DNA polymerase to go again. And you might get another wrong base put in there. Here's a YouTube video you can watch. Um, this is a, a young fellow that has a mutation in one of these genes. One of these genes that's involved in repairing the DNA this way. So this young fella cannot make a functional machine to repair his DNA. When his DNA gets damaged, it stays damaged. So he was out in the sun, and the UV light damaged his skin, and the damaged cells can't heal. And those cells eventually die, and they leave a little pockmark on him, and the neighboring cells around it, hopefully if they're not damaged, they will divide, and hopefully they won't accumulate mutations as they divide, and they'll fill that stuff in. But it happens very slowly, and the people suffer very greatly because of this. Do they just have to put on, like, really high SPF sunscreen? Yeah, I mean, I, if I, I wouldn't be going out. I mean, imagine telling your eight-year-old, sorry, you can't go out skateboarding with everybody else, like, for their whole life. So they wear, you know, they wear, they wear um, sunscreen. They'll um, go, they'll stay in the shade. Um, they'll avoid anything that would potentially damage you, if they're sensible, but 
avoid things that would damage the DNA. All right. Um, this is all we've got time for today. I've got to head out. I've got to take care of something on campus here real quick. Um, we'll come back and pick up from here next time.